from the Clark Ford Studio in Oxford, Mississippi, MBW Digital proudly presents the Oxford Exxon Podcast. I'd say thanks for tuning in, but why am I going to give you a round of applause for something you're supposed to do, to be frank? And now, here are your hosts, Chase Parm. And broadcast school has really paid off. And Neil McCrady. I deserve to be on TV. Friday edition of the Oxford Exxon podcast. I am Chase Parham here in the Clark Ford studio. And again, as we've been giving you every single Friday morning, it is a recorded version of our live shows from Thursday night on the Oxford Square at Funkies. Maddie Lee, the Clarion Ledger writer who covers Ole Miss, joined us last night, discussed her uh, her path to an SEC beat, kind of the uh, circuitous path that she's had through her career so far we uh we talked some baseball we talked plenty of Ole Miss football and then got through Neil's picks as well so good show coming up coming up for you this morning uh again the recorded version from Bunkies last night we gave away another Blue Delta Jeans uh, gift certificate we do that every single week we start these things at 5 30 on Thursdays and the podcast is brought to you by the Oxford Exxon every single day remember to go inside get your stadium cup it's bottomless refills for 49 cents after that. Keep the cup, and for 49 cents, you get it all the way to the top of whatever fountain drink you desire there at any Blue Sky location in Mississippi, including the Oxford Exxon. Follow the Oxford Exxon on Twitter. It's Free Gas Fridays. are still ongoing. Be clever, be witty, and win a free tank of gas before you, uh, you leave town for the weekend. I'm also in the Clark Ford studio, and with Clark Ford, they're in Amory, Mississippi, 662-257-1900, Highway 25 South. Remember, when you're getting the deal done at the very end, tell them about the podcast. They knock $500 off the price for you just by mentioning the podcast. They were the good people at Clark Ford and Ole Miss Athletics. A lot more going on other than just Ole Miss and LSU football Saturday night. The Ole Miss volleyball team returns home on Friday night at 7 p.m. against Georgia. Admission is always free at the Gillum Center, and fresh off a win over number nine Auburn, the Ole Miss soccer team is home on Friday night as they take on Texas A&M at 7 p.m. as well. For more info, visit OleMissSports.com, and then obviously the football team back at home next week against ULM, Nils two alma maters clashing in that one. So without further ado, let's get to the podcast. Again, this is Last Night with Neil, myself, and Maddie Lee from the Clarion Ledger. All right, here we go. <clears throat> is gone and we are uh, in business now as Ole Miss headed to Baton Rouge Saturday night 8 15 to face uh, LSU in Tiger Stadium so today we've got a uh, Matty Lee Claire and Ledger beat writer first few uh, weeks month on the beat something like that so we'll uh, we'll talk a little bit about that her uh, indoctrination into SEC football and more as we go through uh, Neil's picks toward the end of the show. We're going to give out a gift certificate from Blue Delta Jeans. I like everybody's chances. It's in the place tonight to get that one tonight. So uh, we're going to offer that up here in a little bit. We'll give you the question in about 15, 20 minutes. And then, as, uh, as always, just write it on a napkin, lay it down, however you want to do it, get it to us, and I'll, uh, I'll hand that to you when the, uh, when the show is over. For everybody in the house tonight as well, $2 Domestics, $12 Pepperoni Pizza, are the uh, the specials? They've got Frosé up there on the daiquiri uh, board now. The pina colada is gone as uh, the temperatures are going down and dwindling a little bit, much to Neil's delight. So, uh, Neil, hello, Maddie, hello, and we'll uh, we'll get through the next fifty minutes here. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me as well, Chase. Yeah, I'm glad you uh, glad you <laughs> showed up. You. Um, let's jump in right here a little bit. I, 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 I'm curious. You see the job opening for the Ole Miss beat on the Clarion Ledger. You, what, what is sort of the first thought in your head? Hey, I'm moving to Mississippi if I get this. I'm covering the SEC football. What do you know? Kind of take me through some of that, false, that thought process when this thing's first starting. Sure. Um, well, first it was like, oh, Ole Miss. Like, SEC football would be cool, you know? I mean, I grew up in Seattle, Pacific Northwest, Pac-12 country, which – Fantastic. I'm not going to knock the Pac-12. I grew up on it. Or I guess, yeah, I grew up on the Pac-10, but, you know, yeah. semantics. Um, they don't count number, you know, anybody else either, so it's fine. <laughs> so, grew up on Pac-12 football, but you hear all these stories about the SEC and how passionate the fan base is and every writer wants to have their stuff read and cared about. And so, yeah, it was, it was an opportunity I jumped at. So, we're, we're, so yeah, give us because I know a lot of listeners want 
to know like how, where, how you got here. You grew up in Seattle. I know you went to school at Northwestern at one point, but you, did, you, did you go there for undergrad or grad school? For grad school. Grad school. So, hope you all have a minute because this is a, oh, this is, a I, long I, I'm curious. Yeah. <laughs> you just said journey. y'all. You've been in the South for like a <laughs> month and you just said y'all. I blame my quick stop in Kentucky because I started to pick up stuff and then got rid of it and then I'm back and now I, I, don't, I don't even know what I sound like. Like I have all these weird tics from like various places and it's all very confusing. So my route. Um, grew up in Seattle. Went to undergrad at a Division three school called Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon. Okay. I played softball for them, um, and that was fantastic. Loved my time there. We did not have a journalism program, so by the end, you know, a few years in, realized that that was what I wanted to do. I was writing for the paper. I was a sports editor for a little bit. Obviously, loved sports and was playing them. Uh, so. After I graduated, I, you know, I applied for grad school that last year, got in, ended up at Northwestern in Chicago, which was a fantastic place to live, but that's only a 12-month program. Uh, interned for my last quarter at the San Francisco Chronicle, then left there, interned for MLB.com back in Seattle covering the Mariners, then got, had to get a you know, full-time job that was my stop in Kentucky. Worked for the Owensboro Messenger Inquirer Ooh. covering high school sports. Ooh. It, was <laughs> it was obviously so different from anywhere that I'd lived before, but like such a great staff, guys who had been there forever and you know, really got to figure out the heartbeat of that town and their you know, great sports. I got to cover their, one of the teams soccer teams won state within a few weeks of me being there so that was a lot of fun and then from there I got the opportunity to cover MLS out in Salt Lake right moved out there and then this opportunity opened up and now I'm so how in long were city. you how long were you in Owensboro and how long were you at at Salt Lake Owensboro for eight months eight months and then Salt Lake <laughs> for almost exactly a year I think I so you covered a full season. A full season, but split up. <laughs> um, so I got there mid-season, f- finished it out. They added a, a women's professional soccer team, so I got to start covering them, which was fun, and cover in the like very beginnings of that team. And then midway through the next season, left. So Cubs or White Sox, since you were in Chicago for a month? Um, so I lived like an... I've got There's a, no, go ahead. Oh, no, 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 no peer pressure here. Come on. Just keep Neil's like shooting darts at me. Um, I mean, I could tell where the answer was going right away, so I was like, I'm braced for it. Go ahead. No, no, no. I lived very close to Wrigleyville, okay. which was amazing. Yes. So I love that. Love being able but, to but, like but. <laughs> go up no. to, for games. That stadium obviously has so much history, and that was so cool. White Sox games are cheaper. They are cheaper. That Which is true. really helps. And you can get a ticket anywhere in the stadium and sit right up close to the action. Are you, are, are you aware of Neil's really weird superstition for Cubs games? No. Do you know oh, this? Oh, God. What is it? Everybody else in here knows this. You don't know this? I tried it with the Cardinals yesterday, and it didn't work. Okay, so he gets up in the morning. He's been doing this for years. He, I'm, 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 not, I'm not lying. And Literally since about the seventh grade. What really is it really that long? Yeah, seventh grade. Yeah, okay. I'm kind of Whatever the it. number of the starting pitcher of the Cubs is that day, he puts that many deodorant strokes on every, on each arm. Oh wow! Yep. It did not work last night for the uh, the Cardinals. I tried. <laughs> Tried everything. So He's, some days you just smell. He smells fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like when uh, Sean Estes was pitching for the Cubs and he wore number 55. I smelled great on those days. <laughs> it was awesome. How many, how many strokes for the, the Cardinals guy yesterday? It was like 60-something. Gomber. Yeah, seriously. I tried. So do you do it that many on one arm? On uh, both? Yeah, 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 both. Yeah, both. He goes through like eight Ooh. things of deodorant a week. I mean, oh, it, it's, sure. it's, a, it's a scary deal. But. It's not that many. There's a, there's a pattern to it. There's, a, there's an efficiency to it. <laughs> so I'm going to get off this. I, I, we'll we'll move on to some old Miss stuff in a second. But I am curious about this. You come into an SEC beat. You hear all these things. 
I mean, what's it been like? I mean, you know, did it meet what you kind of what you thought? Because I mean, it obviously is a. It's not exactly a pro environment always. It's a little bit of a, a strange deal. So, what's been the uh, the impressions over the last month? Yeah, honestly, it's it's been really fun. Um, <laughs> and this team, as soon as I think like, okay, cool, you know, I've got my footing. I can, I know what to expect next game. They throw you a curveball um, to bring up more baseball analogies, but uh, it's it's been a a wild ride, a lot of fun, a lot of good guys to work with. Um, yeah. Well, not only do you get a new job, but the guy that hires you then leaves for the athletic, and they bring in a new guy. I mean, it's just been one total transition. That's true. I met my current boss before Alabama. I was in the press box catching up with. Uh, some writers on the Bama beat that I know from actually Association for Women in Sports Media. Quick little plug. Amazing program. Yeah, sure. um, but so I was talking with her and then I look across the, the press box and I'm like, oh, I think that's my boss. I should go meet him. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you'll enjoy working with Ron. I've known Ron for longer than I'd like to admit knowing Ron. He's a good dude. He'll, uh, you, you can learn a lot from him. So this is your first trip coming up to Baton Rouge. You've never been to Baton Rouge. You've been all over the country, but you've never been there. Correct. What are your expectations for an 8-15 game at Tiger Stadium? What have you heard? What do you anticipate? That kind of thing. Oh, I heard it's going to be insane. Um, that the fans won't be the most sound of mind by mm -hmm. that point in the evening. Heard the traffic is awful. So yeah, that's planning true. on getting everywhere like two hours before I actually need to be there. Baton Rouge was more impacted by Katrina than, yeah. than maybe any city. I don't want to say any city in the country because I, that's, that's too broad of a statement to make. But it was, I think Baton Rouge doubled in size basically overnight after Katrina because so many people who were rendered homeless, that's, was the first place they could get to and dry land really as crazy as that sounds and then they just stayed there because new orleans for the longest time was not anything resembling what new orleans was before katrina but obviously anytime you double tra you double the population you can't instantly double your infrastructure and traffic there's just different than it used to be i guess now when i go down there i'm used to it and so i expect it but the first couple of times that you'd go to Baton Rouge post-Katrina, you're like, wow, this is nuts. Because when I worked in Mobile, I probably went to LSU five times a, a season. And so I was used to going to those games and kind of had in my mind, you know, rhythms of, okay, it's when I need to leave before a game and stuff. And that got completely out of whack. I think it's gotten better. But, yeah, 8.15 at night because the tailgates will start at 9 in the morning. Ooh. And it'll be, it'll be rough. Do not wear anything. Because where we park, you have a nice little walk. Do not wear red or blue. Wear a green, a brown. Yeah, it was, it was probably 2000. Well, it was 2006. It was the, the overtime game I always talk about over there. And I wore a, just like a French blue button down with a gray sport coat. Just cover the game, whatever, whatever, whatever. And I got about halfway to the stadium and just got surrounded by LSU fans that start chanting Tiger Bait at me. And I'm just like holding up press passes. I'm like holding my hands up going, whoa, 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 whoa. And it went all the way to the stadium right there. It can, it can get a little, uh, oh, little insane. I can, I, mean, I can beat that story. So I was covering the SEC as a whole in Mobile. And it was the day after Thanksgiving, LSU and Arkansas. It was a 1.30 game, and the drive from Mobile is three hours. And I got off to a little bit of a late start. So I'm pulling out of Mobile at 9.30 in the morning, so I'm flying over there. And I, I get there, and I woke up late and all that stuff. And um, I get out of the car, and I'm walking, and people start yelling at me, the tiger bait stuff and all that. And I'm like, what in the hell? And I look down, and I'm wearing a red shirt. And I'm like, oh, my God. I, I wasn't even thinking that morning. You know, I just got dressed and got moving. And I looked like an Arkansas fan. It was crazy. Well, no, you look nothing like an Arkansas fan, actually. Well, that's true. <laughs> but my clothing looked like an Arkansas fan. I looked like I had Arkansas gear on. We took a break in the show to tell you about some of the exciting things going on in Oxford, including double-decker bus tours and every Friday before Ole Miss home football games. So take advantage of those things as well as the Wizard of Oz 
at the Ford Center on October 21st. You can go ahead and get your tickets now for that and much, much more, including, remember, on Thursday nights, not just are we live in town, Dacker Mountain Radio broadcast also in front of a live audience on Thursdays, 6 o'clock in front of Off Square Books for that. Additional events and more, visit OxfordMS.com slash events. We also have a calendar of events online at rebelgrove.com. Podcast also brought to you by Community Mortgage, Oxford, Memphis, Settle County, and Chattanooga. All underwriting and processing is in Memphis, so you're getting local underwriting to understand your market, a leader in condo financing, and the float down option. So you lock in the current rate, but if rates go down before you close, you get that lower rate. You can find Jason at 662-234-2704 or JLO, J-L-O-W-E, at communitymtg.com. The podcast also brought to you by Oxford Wine and Spirits. You're stocking up today. You're getting into town. Listen to this on the way into Oxford. Head on over to College Hill Road next to Lost Pizza. They're already 5% lower in industry prices as it is. You mentioned the podcast. You spent $150 or more. 5% off wine, 10% off liquor with Oxford Wine and Spirits. I'm headed there here in a little while today as well. And if maybe you don't want to pick it up, you want somebody to do it for you, Locker Stockers, the people for you. Still time. You got that locker or that suite at Vault Hemingway Stadium. They'll fill it up for you before home games at Locker Stockers. Mention the podcast. Maybe get a deal with them as well. You can give them a call at 662-586-1487 or info at LockerStockers.com. They will take care of everything for you. And then finally, the podcast also brought to you by John Edwards with Regency Travel, ready to take that golf trip, whether it be inside the United States, Bandon Dunes, Kiowa, or other places like Streamsong, or internationally, if you want to go to Paris, if you want to go to St. Andrews, wherever you want to go, John Edwards can hook you and your buddies up for that golf trip. Give him a call at 901-844-6110 or Edwards at Regency Travel. Dot net. Back to the podcast now as we continue to discuss Ole Miss football. I'm sorry to insult your daughter's future alma mater. Right? Like really? It kind of was a reflex action before I realized it, it, it what I what did over there. I hadn't really caught on yet. <laughs> no, Neil, you, you, you always talk about you like Tiger State more than anything. And I think some of this, as much as you like to uh, not uh, claim certain regions, you're from Louisiana, yeah. probably some pageantry that goes with that a little bit. But, I mean, you're getting the – you're, you're 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 getting the Golden Girls. You're getting yeah. the band. You're getting the whole deal. What what are the couple games or whatever that did kind of sway that opinion for you? Um, I went to a game there when I was in high school. They played Alabama. Bill Curry was the coach and all that stuff. It was just crazy. It was fun. And you know, I grew up in Ruston, and Baton Rouge felt like a metropolis, and so it was intimidating to me as a kid. But the stadium was neat and. They bring the t- you know they don't need more because Peta Peta and all that stuff but <laughs> they, they think bring- Mike gets upset when he gets around the crowd now but- they would bring the the tiger out in the um in kind of the the big buggy thing you know what I'm talking about yeah and it's the- a carriage almost yeah and and the tigers in the thing and the golden girls are which is their dance team is out around them and not the cast of the <laughs> yeah not <laughs> not Rue McC- Rue McClanahan or whatever um. But it was just cool, and their band's awesome, and, and there's just something about the atmosphere there to me. And I'm sure a lot of it is some, some degree of sentimentality with being from Louisiana and all that stuff, but I just like it. I, it's, I don't, some, of the, some of the college football traditions or whatever kind of go over my head or I'm not particularly interested, and that's one that I'll kind of go absorb it a little bit. Like when they play Colin Baton Rouge – is that Garth Brooks, I guess? Yeah. When they play that song and stuff, I don't like Garth Brooks. I don't listen to that music. But when they play that, I'm in. you got for, a truck and boots now. You're all in. But for those three or four minutes, I'm completely into that. And, and I, just, I just think it's the coolest it's atmosphere. A, it's a great fight song. The whole Chinese yeah. bandits thing, you'll yeah. see this. I, mean, I just think it's the coolest really. atmosphere in, in, in sports. And, yeah, it's going to be drunk and it's rowdy. But for whatever reason, for me, when I watch that, it, it's not obnoxious. It's just kind of funny. And now the last time we were there, no, two times ago. 14. In 14. You remember this? So Ole Miss was third in the country, yeah, maybe? Yeah, top they, whatever. They, they'd beaten Alabama, and they'd gone and beaten Texas A&M, and they'd just blown out Tennessee at home. Correct. And they went down to Baton Rouge, and it was a night game. And Ole Miss was a little flat, and LSU was geeked up. And what I remember about that game was after the game – we're trying to get to the media area, which I'll just go ahead and forewarn you, is a nightmare. So Good. prepare yourself for the nightmare of, unless the crowd's thinned out, 
the nightmare of getting out out through the little thing and into the room is just it's horrible and on this day the media guys are like just follow us and so we're doing it and this louisiana state patrolman is yelling at me you can't go there and i'm i'm like i'm i'm, I'm with the media and he's telling this guy's telling me to do it you can't go there and i said i have to and he he was nasty you remember that i was telling you about it he was he was so angry and it was Man, I kept thinking, what would it have been like if you guys had lost? Because LSU won. I mean, LSU stormed the field and, and all that stuff, which seems like a million years ago compared to what you know it, the expectations are this Saturday. But but it was different. The, you, you never really know exactly what environment you're going to get there, but you always know you're going to get an environment. It's going to be different. Yeah, no, I'm I'm stoked. All week, I think we've been asking the guys – especially the ones who haven't been to Baton Rouge before. Like, what do you expect? What have you heard? And I'm sitting there just, like, eating it up. Yeah. Like, oh, really? <laughs> cool. <laughs> now I know what to, what to expect. It can, get, it can get super loud where it's just – you've been there, Chase, a bunch of times. It, it can get so loud that it's, it's just – it's deafening. Well, that's what I was asking, you know, Jacob Hester back in the day because in 06 – LSU gets a big lead. I mean, I'm sorry, Ole Miss gets a big lead. LSU comes down on essentially what's going to be the last play of the game and throws a touchdown pass, kick the extra point to win, and Ole Miss blocks it. And it's the biggest 180 from as loud as you've ever heard it to as quiet as you've heard, ever heard it in two seconds, just pin drop. LSU ends up winning overtime. But, I mean, as, as I wrote, Ed Orgeron somehow at that point of his career called a pretty good game that night, and then now he is at a – at LSU 12 years later, and here we are. No, you, you, that's the only thing, bad part with you. You have no Ed Orgeron stories. Everybody else has Ed Orgeron stories, and you have nothing. So. I know. I'm sorry. It's I'll, okay. I can make some up. <laughs> You've uh, been working all week on a, Jordan, uh, a story on Jordan Tamu coming into uh, the game last, week, last year against LSU after uh, Shea Patterson gets hurt. What uh, did you kind of learn from it? What sort of the impressions? Just kind of take me through maybe something that uh, was unexpected as you were talking to, uh, to people for that. Yeah, sure. So um, I figured I'd come at it at a – everyone obviously saw it. Everyone knows what's happened, but at the time didn't know how important that would be because, you know, no one had gotten back Shay's MRI or anything like that. So I, I did a sort of oral history of that moment of – or I guess both moments when he comes in. Um, and I'd heard from various people, like – he was very calm. He was very, you know, grounded. And you look at his stats, and he was, what, 7 of 11, um, ran for, like, 20 yards or something like that. So, obviously, for a backup coming in, that's pretty impressive against LSU. And he would really barely played maybe a couple minutes in garbage time, right? So I came in knowing all of that. But what was interesting was, you, I mean, you hear about how composed and everything is, but he's also just like a regular person. So you do hear about these moments where AJ mentioned where, uh, where Jordan turned to him and was like, why are you over here? And he was like, this is where I'm supposed to be for this route. And so there are moments where like, and Jordan even said he was so nervous until the ball snapped and then it was just like any normal game. So I thought those were were the most fun moments to, to pull out and the things that you don't see or hear when you're just watching the game. So it's on the website now, maybe, we think? Check. Perhaps? Okay, I'll look <laughs> in a second as we, uh, as we move along. Good time to uh, ask the Blue Delta Jeans trivia question of the night. Again, I've got the gift certificate over in my bag. First person in here to uh, answer it, bring it over on a napkin or something, we'll uh, award that. If no one answers it, then we'll uh, continue it to the uh, audio recording in the morning and open it up to uh, the rest of the world. But the question, give me the last two Ole Miss quarterbacks that started two wins against LSU during their careers. The two quarterback, the last two quarterbacks to beat LSU twice in their careers as starting quarterbacks is the uh, – is the question for uh, for tonight? Obviously, Jordan Tamu trying to do it in his final appearance as uh, as an Ole Miss Rebel. So that's the question tonight. Neil's got his uh, thinking cap on over here. He's contemplating it a little bit, and we'll uh, we'll Did move forward to see. That was very very quick already. We've got an answer oh, popping wow. up in like ten seconds. That might be the fastest one we've got if it's right. 
I need two, but that is not correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can have it back. You can have your napkin back. Oh. Yeah, he went one and two as a starter against him, right? Uh, yeah, I think that is right. I've actually got it right here, but I'm pretty sure that is uh, right. Yeah, I can go ahead and give that hint. Eli Manning, not uh, one of the, uh, the two answers for that. LSU winning in 2002 and 2003, a 14 13 game in 2002, yeah. and then the uh, the game the, obviously that everybody yeah. remembers from from 2003. Not he had that, a great game down there in 2001. Yeah, they they beat them bad in 2001. Yeah, um, that's actually I, I I ranked today on the site the last five Ole Miss wins in the series, and actually 01 was the fifth one. It's been 2001 since they won five times. That was the fifth win, and uh, since I guess it's now dating back. So. Anyway, with that, you, we mentioned this. I'm not to open up wounds. We talked about 14 for a minute, but 03, you covered that game, Neil. I did. What sort of your impressions for that as, as time has gone on? It's the 50, it's the 15 year anniversary now. I was in Mobile and I was covering the league as a whole, and I was so glad because it got me out of uh, iron stuff. I talked to thousands of people and written a ton that week, and I remember getting here and you could just feel it. There was nerves, and then in the pregame they did that pregame video thing with Johnny Vaught yeah. where he talked about how LSU was always the foil and I kind of couldn't believe that that's what they did I just kind of couldn't believe it and um, and I remember what was the kid's name that Travis Johnson Travis maybe? Johnson yeah yeah I can't believe I remember that intercepted a pass early in the game and ran it back in for a touchdown and this press box shook which will probably shock you after being at the Kent State game Saturday the press box shook and I thought, they've got a chance. And then it got away, and then he missed the field goals late. And then I can remember that last play when, I guess, Eli stepped on Doug Buckle's foot and fell down, yeah. saying to someone, man, it's going to be a long time before they're that close again. 11, 12 years, was, I guess. Yeah, it was yeah. basically till 2015, 2016. Um, but, yeah, I, I just – in the, the Grove that day, someone talked me into coming to try to see them in the Grove. This is my one big memory of it. To get through the grove, to get through the grove took an hour and a half. Oh, man. So, really? Yeah, someone said, hey, come see. And I, I didn't go to Ole Miss all the time. At the time, I had no idea I was going to be here living. And, and I, I said, okay, I'll come see. I had no idea it would be that crazy. But it, it took forever. I didn't, th- I, I didn't think I'd get to the stadium in time. I'll tell you one of my very unathletic moments. You mentioned Travis Johnson a minute ago. So I played baseball against him in high school. He went three for three against me one night with three bunt singles. I could not get to the <laughs> ball and throw him out before he got to first base. Went three for three with three bunt singles one night. So there's that. Wow. Yeah. I did strike out Bill Hall one time, though. That was like probably my one moment. You know, you don't play a lot of people that played the major league, so Bill Hall was kind of it, but did get that one. That was probably the low light of his baseball Probably career. was. <laughs> not, not going up on his mantle anywhere. So we got a winner for the uh, Blue Jeans Delta trivia question. The answers: Jevin Sneed beats them in 2008 and 2009 back-to-back when they uh, really just routed them against, uh, in, in nuts first year in 08 and then won the Les Miles clock screw-up game in 2009, and then Romero Miller beat them oh. twice during his career. It was during a uh, three-game winning streak for Ole Miss. They beat them in 2007, in, or sorry, in 1997 in the game after the week after LSU had beaten number one Florida. And yeah. then, uh, then Ole Miss won, and then in 98 and 99 as well. 98 was an overtime win, 37-31, when on the game-winning touchdown, the ball popped up out of Corey Peterson's hands and fell down on his chest. That picture's hanging up a lot of places in, uh, in Oxford, and then 42-23, a uh, pretty big win in 99 against an LSU team that, frankly, wasn't very good. So those, uh, those in a row there for uh, Romero and Jevin. Got a winner, as always. BlueDeltaJeans.com. You can build, you can buy, and their studio, just a golf shot from us over here on the, uh, on the Oxford Square as we, uh, as we move on. But anyway, there's, uh, there's that. Let's get into Neil's picks a little bit for the, uh, the week. Neil had another very mediocre week of Neil's picks as I'm looking at the record setting up now. You did go 7-1 and one overall, but against the spread, 4-4. Four and four. Jeffrey Wright, red hot, 7-1 and one against the spread on the week. I went 5-3, and three, and I am now tied with Barrett Clark for the overall lead on the season at 23-11 and 11 against the spread. First place is overrated. It is. You, really are, is. At, uh, you are at 17-17 and 17 against the spread, so you're uh, just paying the juice at this point. Yep. As you say in here, platitudes aren't working. Your eyes are still in the wrong place. <laughs> yep. The effort's not there. You know, 
You just got to pump them up a little more as you're getting started. You, you with know the, the one interns. thing I was going to tell you before we get into the picks. The one thing I most remember about the night that Jordan Tamu came in is that we had done Neil's picks the, the day before <laughs> and had dedicated the entire thing to Sean Patterson Sr. Do you remember that? Oh, and oh, then yes. Shea gets hurt in that game. I'm like, this probably not. Well, a little probably- history lesson for you, Maddie. We, we don't take this very serious. It's very sarcastic. We take shots at ourselves and everyone else. So the week before, we had picked Vanderbilt to beat Ole Miss. We were really stupid because Vanderbilt was a bad football team. But Shea actually, after the game, asked where we were to call us out for the pick against Vanderbilt. His dad was not happy. We exchanged multiple Facebook messages with his dad throughout the week. His dad told us that if we did not uh, get a tear in our eye as Ole Miss scored touchdowns, we should move on to another beat yeah. and another team. He yeah. was Sean Patterson Sr. showing the stability that he has a year later uh, early with us last year against, uh, against the, LSU. The conversation between myself and Sean Patterson Sr., have you ever talked to a two-year-old <laughs> that's throwing a temper tantrum because he or she is really hungry? And yeah, yes, yeah, I have. <laughs> or they're exhausted. There's no rationalizing with that particular two-year-old. It was much like that. It was, it was very similar to a conversation with a hungry, exhausted, hot two-year-old. And he appears to have not matured as we, we move forward. Yeah, most, we, had, we had planned to really make fun of him this year, and then the Ohio State thing happens and some other things where it just kind of took it, took it out of you to really go down that path as we've moved on. Yeah, and given some of the things that I've seen him text to Ole Miss people, and I kind of wish that I had because I think – I think he would have taken the bait, and that would have given us fresh material. But it's not too late. The season's still young. We take a break from the show to tell you that this podcast is brought to you by Robert Gambrell and Gambrell and Associates. Robert knows that many of the people listening to this podcast will never need a bankruptcy attorney or a Social Security disability attorney. However, many of you may be interested in re- reviewing your financial situation to consider asset protection. This is a part of what a good bankruptcy attorney does. And also, many of you have friends and or relatives that get into difficult financial situations. Gambrell and Associates helps many people work through their times of hardship, whether that results in filing a bankruptcy petition or working to avoid a bankruptcy filing. Others are primarily worried about their credit scores for those people. Uh, Many times, Gambrell and Associates refer their clients to Brian McLaurin, another advertiser on this podcast. Sometimes people find the easiest way to rebuild credit is similar to what the Cubs did. Tear it down, start over. This can be done by filing for relief under Chapter 7 to get a fresh start. Whatever your needs are, you, your relatives, or friends can get a free consultation for one hour or more to help make your decision on what is best for you. Check out Robert Gambrell on avvo.com, superlawyers.com, or give him a call, 662-281-8800. This podcast is also brought to you by Grenada Nissan. If you're in the market for a Nissan vehicle, look no further than Grenada Nissan. Uh, located just off Interstate 55 in Grenada, Mississippi, uh, Grenada Nissan has a complete selection of new and previously owned Nissan vehicles. Great lease deals as well. Gene and Sandy have been with the website, the podcast, a long time. They're great people, great service, great product. You will uh, love doing business with the people at Grenada Nissan. It's GrenadaNissanUSA.com. Uh, the podcast also brought to you by Harry Alexander. Harry is an Oxford-based Remax Legacy Realty agent. Harry's been in Oxford more than four decades. No one knows the residential and condo market in Oxford better than Harry. Go to his site. He'll prove it to you. It's harryalexander.com. Click on the Properties and Neighborhoods tab. Filter through by what you are looking for and then send him an email. It's ha at harryalexander.com. We could add it in right here. But anyway, first game of the week, Louisiana (laughs) Lafayette plus 49. It's come under 50 at least. Plus 49 at number one, Alabama, 11 a.m. Alabama in the midst of two straight 11 a.m. games for uh, for the Tide SEC Network. For this one, just by principle, I can't lay 50 points. I'm going to take you. I love to cover that just barely. You, however, do have them covering. You have Alabama by 50 in this one, Neil. What do you I think, do Maddie? I the same thing. I'm not betting against Alabama. No, I know. It's 50 I don't, points. I don't know. 50, as Houston would say. 50. <laughs> I don't know how Alabama doesn't score 56 points in this game. You're probably right. But that's just that's a lot. Did you see the game that they played two weeks ago? I did. I saw some of it. <laughs> well, so they're going to play all those quarterbacks. Jalen's going to play, right? They're going to kill that whole red shirt idea and stuff, right? I think so. I, I think he wants to play. Why? 
he has told people that he thinks it's his best path to the NFL to go ahead and play this season, to get experience working with those receivers, graduate, and then he can transfer someplace next season and play in a passing offense. He does not want to go play in an RPO run-oriented offense. He wants to go someplace and throw. In his eyes, he's already proven that he can run. He wants to prove now that he can make NFL throws. He did look better throwing the football against Ole Miss a couple weeks ago than he did a year earlier. He wasn't perfect, but I could even kind of like Mac Jones. He could go play somewhere, be somebody's quarterback. Well, that tells you where Alabama's football program is today. They're the kid like Jones who could have probably picked up the phone and gone to 80% of the programs in the country, and he's their third teamer. What were your first impressions of Alabama in person? Maddie? Oh, Tua was so much fun to watch. I, was, yeah, no, go ahead. No, they're, I mean, they're impressive. And you see it on TV, but to be there in person and, and watch a smackdown like that is, is something else. I covered him, and he came to Ole Miss for a junior day right before he committed to Alabama. Actually, the day before he took yeah. his first visit to Alabama. And he, he was not a good poker player. He was doing the whole, well, it's USC or Ole Miss or, or Alabama and all that. And the whole time you went, hey, it's going to Alabama. This, yeah. this, this is even a thought here because – they weren't a family that you thought, okay, they're going to stay on the West Coast, stay close to Hawaii or anything. It was like, no, because they've moved to Hawaii. The kid plays for Thompson High School, I think, in Tuscaloosa, the younger brother. He plays at Thompson in Alabaster, which is uh, a suburb of Birmingham. Yeah. No help at all there, right? Uh, no, it, it's a frequent thing. You, you, you notice families move from Hawaii to Alabaster uh, pretty, much, pretty much weekly. That happens a lot, and the fact that, that uh, he and his brother are both excellent quarterbacks is – Absolutely a coincidence. Yeah. Arkansas plus 18 and a half versus Texas A&M, AT&T what? Stadium in, in room, Arlington, people Texas. People in the room act like I'm being sarcastic. There's, that's not odd, is it, that you would leave Hawaii and completely move your entire family and move to Alabaster? It's what's 3,000 well, I mean, miles. Lane Kiffin moved from Manhattan Beach to Tuscaloosa, but they paid him $2 million to do that. It's so only slightly more than you would otherwise yeah, if you were I mean, in Tagovailoa. People move all the time. It's a, what, what is the, what is the People ride? People do move all the time. Yeah, I mean, look at you. You've moved everywhere. I <laughs> Seattle mean, to Mississippi over here, and she's not getting to a type money to do it. So. There's, a, there's a ride at Disney World about this. It's a small world after all. I mean, it, it, it is. So there you go. So what are we the doing in, uh, in, in, in Jerry this World this week, Neil? Plus 18 and a half for a hapless Arkansas team. Well, sorry, Wally Hall said they're actually better than Auburn, so I apologize. Arkansas A&M plus 18 and a half this week in Jerry World. You know, in all seriousness, um, I was impressed with what I saw of Texas A&M Saturday against Alabama. They made Alabama play. Alabama still stomped them, sure, but Alabama didn't, you know, kind of have their way with them. I, I thought you can tell that A&M's getting better. Mond is a good quarterback. Um, they're getting better on the defensive side. They did some things to frustrate Alabama at times. I, I'm laying the points. Go ahead, Manny. Yeah, and Arkansas scored what, like a touchdown? Uh, oh, he's got a field goal. Field goal? Oh, field goal. sorry, my bad, my bad. I was it was a to majestic field goal. I was trying to give him a little more. Um, now Wally I sound Hall, like I'm just signing. Wally I'm, Hall, the longtime columnist. Do you, you see this? The longtime columnist for the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, and I like Wally, but Wally said that Auburn won the game on special teams. Everywhere else, Arkansas outplayed Auburn. Now that's spin. <laughs> Thirty-four to three was the final score for that. So, your story is not up online at clarionledger.com as of uh, six ten p.m. on Thursday night. Oops. Yeah, well, it's okay. It'll be there by tomorrow. It'll be there in the I morning. Promise. All good. No, I'm taking a.m. and two. I, the, 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 I thought it was a one-off with Clemson. I'll be honest. I think I was a little bit wrong there. I mean, they're not going to go win nine games or anything, but he has at least changed some of the culture around them from an energy standpoint and from. Frankly, a discipline standpoint, if you want to be the way that, that, that that's worked out. Because, yeah, you're right. They made one bad play against Alabama in the first half and were sl still losing 31-13. to 13. They threw the interception early. But otherwise, played a pretty solid game against the Crimson Tide last week. Jeffrey uh, doing the same thing. He's got it 38-17. to 17. You have it 40-17 to 17 between Arkansas and Texas A&M. Your favorite, Mr. Jeremy Pruitt and the Tennessee Volunteers, 
you need to change this line. You currently, I, I would, I would feel great about betting, betting my entire mortgage, your entire mortgage, oh, Maddie's did I get mortgage, the plus everything. Minus wrong? You have the plus minus wrong. You have Tennessee giving thirty one points to number two Georgia on oh, Saturday. I like Georgia. In, in Athens. I gotta leave. I gotta go to the bank. <laughs> yeah. So oh. <laughs> Georgia minus thirty one on Saturday. Do you remember when this was a huge game? I mean, you probably watched this game in Seattle or wherever. Georgia Tennessee was a big national. And CBS is trying to kind of force the issue a little bit, but it's not. There's nothing compelling about this game at all. He's going to fail. He's this decade's at Orgeron. I know Tyler says that he's recruiting better and stuff like that, but it's just not. I, I, I don't buy it. I, I just think there's no way Jeremy Pruitt succeeds as Tennessee head coach. I agree. You good? Okay. Are you, what do you think? Point spread? You, you laying 31 points, or do you think Tennessee covers? Well. Now I've said that everyone's going to cover, <laughs> and I'm getting in my head, but uh, yeah, no, I think I, I can't bet against Alabama. I'm not going to bet. You're not putting Georgia. real money on it. It's I'm, okay. You're just, you're just picking a oh team. Oh, man, if I ever put real money down on any sports betting, I'd be in real trouble. Eh, Neil does it from time to time. It's been twice. a while. Been a while? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, John Georgia minus thirty one. That's plenty uh, in Athens on Saturday. They, they, they're not Alabama machine, but they're machine enough as uh, as time has passed. It's still going to continue improving. I mean, they, they they was a sleeping giant. Those boosters were ready to get going in uh, in Athens. What are you implying? I'm implying that there's a little help there on uh, oh. between the hedges, if you will. The tongue of Aloha, the tongue of Aloha's did not move to Athens. Just pointing that out. They did not. Jake Fromm, Jacob Eason, and Justin Fields did, however, all in a row. Just three five-star quarterbacks because, I mean, you know, it's very often that five-star quarterbacks follow other five-star quarterbacks to a campus. You know what is interesting? After, yeah. uh, after the Clemson deal with, with Lawrence and, and uh, Kelly Bryant uh -huh. is that, that Kirby Smart could be dealing with something similar here soon because Fields looks like the better quarterback and Fromm's the guy and all that stuff, but they're only separated by one year, and it's going to be difficult to keep both of them happy. Southern Miss, plus 27 this weekend. Jack Abraham, the quarterback of the Golden Eagles, at number 10 Auburn, 3 p.m. SEC Network on this one. Um, it's another huge line. I'm actually taking Southern Miss to cover this line on, uh, on Saturday. Go ahead, Maddie. I'm not. You're not Auburn <laughs> but, all the way? But I might just be. You're taking every favor. Just yeah, no, no matter I what really the point. I am. No. I need to. Maybe I need. Uh, You've which, only been be you, you've only been around like a month, month and a half, something like that. So how, how long is it now? What day did you so, get hired? So I'm not so I'm not allowed to. Uh, two and a half months. Okay, no. fair enough. Um, I know I'm I'm high on the favorites. Maybe I just haven't seen Southern. I mean, but they blew like the Jackson State game. Obviously, Southern Miss yeah, blew count. them out. Um, but, yeah, I don't know how much you can put on, on games like that, and I just I don't see him. I don't know. I have faith in <laughs> Neil has this thing 45-17 yeah, on Saturday. Southern Miss lost to ULM. You think ULM's pretty competent, though. I mean, all, all jokes aside, yeah, I mean, all, you think they're a pretty decent football team. I mean, if, if you have stock in the ULM program, first of all, God bless you. Second, um, their second half against Troy is a, probably a building block. They're down 35-7 to seven at the half, and they come back and only lose by a touchdown and had a chance. It's probably a building block. Viator's done a good job there. If I'm Ole Miss, we're jumping ahead a little bit. We'll get back into picks in a second. It's the one thing about this game. There's so much hype on Ole Miss LSU always, and, and there's this sense in town about – you know, maybe there's a chance because LSU. Well, because LSU is so gettable. I mean, it, 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 relative to what top five teams look like, LSU does not look like that. Their offense is very, very bad. Defensively, they got some issues. They lost their best pass rusher before the year starts. I mean, Christian Fulton, of all people, is getting hammered right now in the defensive backfield as far as receivers picking on him. I mean, he was the culprit for the kid for Louisiana Tech last week. When, uh, yeah. when Fulton was covering that kid, the kid went five catches for 94 yards and two touchdowns before they moved Greedy Williams over on him. So – I mean, they have holes as, a, as an opponent and definitely as a top-five team. Just from a psyche standpoint, if Ole Miss doesn't play well Saturday night, if it goes badly, if LSU runs them out of the stadium, I think next weekend's a real trap game. I mean, all jokes aside, at some point you just can't keep getting up 
And if the environment is something similar to what the environment appeared to be and what you all have described it to be last week, that won't impact a team like ULM. They're used to playing in that environment. That environment's comfortable to them. They get, I don't know what they announce for home attendance in Monroe, but it's probably 10,000. So there's 25,000 people there. That's going to feel like a big crowd. Yeah, I just think it's why it's, it's so important for Ole Miss this week to be competent. Maybe they don't win the game, but just stay in it for four quarters, do whatever they're going to do because that at least puts a little more energy in that crowd next week for, for ULM because otherwise you, have the, you run the risk of running that Kent State crowd out there two weeks in a row, and I think that's the, that's the problem for Ole Miss right now. So. Well, and that was expected, I mean, maybe not even four quarters against Alabama. They are just expected to keep it the game for a couple, and we saw what happened. We take a break to tell you that guests join our podcast on the Billy's Pecans Hotline. Billy's Pecans has a complete selection of pecans, goodies, uh, jellies, coffee cakes. We tell you about the cinnamon spice pecans all the time. The toasted pecans are awesome. Uh, All sorts of chocolate pecans, milk chocolate, dark chocolate, white chocolate, chocolate amaretto, chocolate Grand Marnier, the cheese crispers, cheese crispies, I should say, the coffee cakes. Everything's great at Billy's Pecans, whether you're getting ready for a high school tailgate, getting ready for a college tailgate, getting ready to make a road trip to Houston or wherever, Billy's Pecans is a great option. You'll be thrilled that you uh, have some Billy's Pecans with you on your tailgate, on your trip. It's billyspecans.com or 1-800-624-7404. The podcast is also brought to you by 7 South Tailgating. 7 South celebrating 10 years of business this season. Try 7 South once. You'll never tailgate without them again. 7 South will set up your own personal gear or you can rent everything from them. No one matches their customer service, their attention to detail. Whether you're coming up for one game this fall or all the games this fall or anything in between, whether your tailgate is intricate or really de- or uh, very simple, 7 South can take care of you. 7SouthTailgating.com. If you're in the uh, Birmingham area and you're in the real estate market, perhaps get in touch with Megan Phillips with LAH Real Estate. She's the person to call for all your real estate needs in the Birmingham area. With almost a decade of experience, Megan's knowledge and expertise can help you buy or sell your home today. So please visit her website at MeganMPhillips.com. That's M E A G A N M Phillips.com. Or call Megan at 205-602-7929. Again, 205-602-7929. And this podcast is brought to you by Oxford University Bank. OUB is locally owned and operated right here in Oxford. When you deposit money at OUB, that money and the vast majority of the bank's profits go right back into the Oxford community. OUB gives you the comfort of home all the benefits the big mega banks provide, all the technology and products you can want, all with the personal touch. When you call OUB, you speak directly with the live person. There's no 10 buttons to press, no five-minute wait. OUB also offers its customers the absolute best cash checking account. It's called Casasa. And with Casasa, OUB will pay customers 2.5% interest on their balances, up to $50,000. And with Casasa, ATM fees nationwide are refunded. OUB also offers online bill pay and mobile check deposit using its online app. To learn more about OUB, check out liveoxfordbankoxford.com or call 662-234-6668. OUB is FDIC insured. I'm so excited for people to see this in you the know, morning when we post. But along, along the lines yeah. of what Maddie's saying, and she's right, is – you can't keep flirting with disaster. You know, they flirted with disaster against Southern Illinois. And everybody goes, well, they came out in the second half. Okay, great. And they flirted with disaster against Kent State for three quarters. And I know there were delays and all that stuff. But you do that over and over and over again. And eventually, we always use snake analogies. If you poke the damn thing enough times and it strikes at you, well, eventually it's going to get you. And I just think they're in danger of doing that if they can't get out of some of their habits. There's all this talk about what do they have to do to, to, uh, to beat LSU. Well, step one, honestly, is to play a good first half. They haven't played a good first half since Texas Tech. Yeah, and last week was the best first half we've seen from the defense yet, and the offense was... Yeah. 
They, they've got to put something together as a, as a team in the first half or else – Look, LSU's going to get geeked. Whatever issues LSU has or doesn't have, they're going to come out kind of ready to play and all that stuff. And you've got to match that intensity. And to use one of their code, one of their code words, you have to match their focus early in a game. And they haven't done that since September the 1st. Well, when you look at Saturday, yeah, the defensive line was much more active. There's no doubt about that against Kent State. But, Matty, I'll ask you, because the way I'm reading Matt Luke – those guys that kind of did that aren't necessarily going to see increased snap counts with Charles Wiley and Markel Winters because of the type of team they're playing. They're going to play more of the downhill running game team with LSU. Matt's made a point two or three times this uh, this week already to say, yeah, we like what those guys gave, but the way we had them set up with Wiley inside and some of those things, that was simply because it was a spread team and in some ways. It's kind of the defensive version of Longo going, we're going to do whatever they give us. So – I don't know that necessarily that thing. I think this the, the onus still comes back to Benito and Josiah if they're healthy, obviously, moving into Saturday night. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think if you are going forward with them, you, ha- you use that momentum and you hype them up and you say, yes, we did that on purpose. Like, we're going to keep trying to do this. And that, that wasn't the message that we got. It was we're really excited about what they did, but that's not the game plan. It's always, you yeah. know. I'm so excited in the morning for everybody to see the picture that Neil used for the uh, the Vanderbilt game against Tennessee State tomorrow. We're not spending no time on this game whatsoever, but I will I, I will ask Maddie what's what's going through this girl's head right now in this photo. <laughs> we, 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 we've got we, we've got disappointed crowd shot from last week on the uh, on the screen for next uh. week. That's She's a, not happy, right? No, like, if that's you, a straight up, you've got to be kidding. Yeah, if, if, you got, if, if you're a guy and, and, and your girl gives you this look, run. Run Absolutely. away. Don't ask any questions. <laughs> don't what, answer any questions for sure. Whatever it was you've been doing, she caught you. Yeah, yeah. That, that's what that is. So, anyway, Vanderbilt playing Tennessee State at 3 p.m. on, uh, on Saturday. The, uh, the one in Starkville, the one Ross Dellinger has been hanging out in a, a bobs all week for ten, Florida and Mississippi State. Florida plus eight at number 23. The Bulldogs, they're still ranked somehow. 5 p.m. ESPN. Neil, you've uh, you've kind of changed your take on this one as yeah. the week's moved on. I was going to take Florida, and uh, I, I, I filled in this week for uh, radio in Memphis, and I had Cole Kubelik on as a guest. And I covered Cole at Auburn in 99, the year that, Tommy Tuberville coached against Ole Miss for the first time. And he was telling me, if you go back, and you and I talked about this, a little history lesson. That week, it was late September, probably this same week of the season, uh, Auburn had just gone to LSU and destroyed LSU in Tiger Stadium. Smoked cigars on the field, the whole deal. And Ole Miss had lost at home to Vanderbilt in an upset loss. And Auburn was a favorite and all that stuff, but Cole talked about how when that game started, he noticed two things within a couple of series. One, the Ole Miss kids had, in his words, blood in their eyes. It had an intensity that Auburn did not expect. To me, it was an SEC game. You knew it was going to be intense, but it was different. It was was jacked up. And then secondly, and more importantly, Ole Miss knew everything that was coming. That defense had worked against that offense for three years, four years. They knew what was coming. They knew the calls. They literally knew the verbiage. I don't think they even changed the audible packages. They knew the verbiage. They knew the audibles. As the call was getting changed at the line of scrimmage, Ole Miss's linebackers were saying, yeah, Ole Miss actually had linebackers. Ole Miss's linebackers said, here's what's coming, literally calling the play out. And Auburn had to scrap basically their entire plan late in the second quarter and start over. And Ole Miss won that game in overtime, the Corey Peterson catch from Romero Miller. And he was just saying that we never could match their intensity. And, and so I think you're going to see some of There's no way that the Florida kids are going to be able to feel as emotionally involved in this game as the Mississippi State kids will. Throw in the embarrassment of a week ago and all of that. I just think everything sort of points towards Mississippi State. I'm going to switch things up. I think, <laughs> I think State will win. But I'm, I'm going to go with Florida to cover. And I think all of that is absolutely legit. Um, and, you know, obviously Florida is not going to 
walk in there and be behind Mullen and be like, yeah, we have the same intensity and passion about this game as the entire state team does. But I was more... Watching them against Kentucky was just eye-opening. Yeah, it was, it was definitely eye-opening. So it, that can go one of two ways. It can go the way you're saying where that revs them up and you know they had their, their uh, player-only meeting and they've got it all on track or... Here's, their pro- here's State's problem, to your point. State's problem is that their quarterback is still Nick Fitzgerald. And all the team meetings in the world and all the emotion and adrenaline in the world isn't going to make him a better passer. And I agree with Cole, who said this uh, on the show in Memphis. He doesn't think he's healthy. That was a severe injury against Ole Miss. I mean, go back and look at that. I mean, the, the ankle is dangled. and all. Gordon Hayward with the Celtics suffered that injury in – what mid October last season when the yeah. NBA season started, he's just now yeah he's just now one hundred percent, and it's September so it's been eleven months. Well, Nick Fitzgerald hasn't had eleven months for that to heal, and I don't know. I, he to me he doesn't look like the same caliber of athlete, and I'm not criticizing, but that was a, a, a bad injury, and if he can't run the way that he used to run, and he throws the way that he used to throw. Well, now he's no longer really a serviceable quarterback. And the truth is, against Kentucky, to your point, Maddie, I didn't think he looked serviceable. I kept waiting for Mississippi State to go, hey, let's just try something different. Let's put Keontae Thompson in there and just see what happens. And they didn't do it. It, And this is where you have a little bit of Moorhead being a first-year head coach of it's kind of like Chad Morris at Arkansas where, look, I've, I'm going to run this Sam system, and I've got to recruit to this system, and I've got to put this system on TV so that the kids can see it. And if that's the system he's going to run, they're really vulnerable. Thompson's a better quarterback at this point. There's no doubt about that. I, I thought it was one of the more underrate, underrated shots on our message board yesterday when I posted the, uh, the Jacob Hester interview from our podcast on the board. And somebody goes, oh, yeah, he was the best uh, – best white running back in the SEC until Nick Fitzgerald came along. Yeah, I kind of yeah. got a little kick out of that as they were running yesterday. But, um, you know, State is running into two problems. One, because he has no capital built up, they're blaming Moorhead instead of Fitzgerald. They're still riding 100% from a fan base standpoint on Fitzgerald at this point. It's it's all on Moorhead. He should have just gave it to Kyle, Kyle and Hill 38 times and letting him win the game and all this stuff. And then two, the reason I'm taking Florida, I don't think State can stay composed. We talked about it earlier in the week against Ole Miss. They had some skirmishes at different times. They couldn't stay composed against Kentucky last week. Jeffrey Simmons and Minnie Snell get into it before the game. They've just not shown an ability to stay and handle that emotion, and they're going to have more of it on Saturday than they've had any other time this year. So I, just, I think that combusts on them early to some extent that Florida has a way to get ahead a little bit. Kind of my thoughts. So we'll see. But. We'll see. I mean, the way you've been picking them, Florida should feel really good yeah. today as we, yeah. uh, as we move ahead into the games. <laughs> South Carolina plus one, suddenly a, uh, a really, really good game. South Carolina, very, very good, as our message board would say. South Carolina plus one. Very, at, yes, very good. Number 17, Kentucky, 6.30 p.m. SEC Network, the Wildcats, and the Gamecocks from, uh, from Lexington. When was the last time that Kentucky football was compelling two weeks in a row? But this is this is I'm I'm fascinated. Well, I don't think they've been ranked since Andre Woodson was the quarterback. I think that was the last time. They're fun. You have no idea, right, Randy? They're fun. They were fun to watch the other night. And and they still the, have no quarterback, but they have Benny Snell. They have just enough quarterback play to take a shot here and there. What was fun to me about watching them is that no matter what you think about Mississippi State's offense, right? Their defense is good, especially their front seven. They're athletes on their front seven. There were times the other night that it was like third and two, and they would just get in the Wildcat, snap it to Snell, and you, everyone in the stadium, including the 11 guys in Maroon, knew what was coming. There's nothing you can do about it. And that was kind of fun to watch because whatever Jeffrey Simmons said to Benny Snell, I would suggest that South Carolina not say that to Benny Snell. It got him fired up. He was fun. You've given up on Boom in four weeks. It took four weeks for you to give up on Muschamp. I'm fickle. 
And, and <laughs> since you you didn't want to take Benny Snell on as your football season lover. I tried last Saturday. I gave him a what's up. We, we no. I, I, I misspelled his name. I'm sorry yeah. about that. But no. It's too late for you. Okay. I, I, he, he and I already have a, a special thing going. I have a thing for obscure running backs. I pick one every year. Ralph Webb was my guy from Vanderbilt for multiple years. I really like Larry Rose the third that played in New Mexico State. I've had a few along the way. Benny Snell was your type. I, yeah. I'm, I'm just shocked that you didn't you didn't I'm, move I, in I'm on still really quicker. hurt that I reached out to Ralph Webb in multiple ways to come <laughs> on the show, and he will not do it. I, I, I'm jilted at this point, Neil. I it is what it is. so hard. I know. We've given it shots. We might still. I, I, I think he's unemployed at this time. So, uh, it, he anyway. Might, he might be so concussed that he can't come on after yeah. some of the hits. Well, again, a lot of tread comes off the tires over four years as the Vanderbilt running back. Uh, South Carolina, I think. I like Jake Bentley. I still like Must Champ it up. I think Kentucky's going to have a bit of a hard time getting up like that two weeks in a row. Even though it's home, I think the Gamecocks get a road win in Lexington this uh, this week. What do you think, Maddie? I'm going to go with the home team. There you go. I'm, I'm the Everybody's same taking Kentucky but me. I'm the only, No, Jeffrey and I. Jeffrey and I are both taking South Carolina in this one. I'm, I'm kind of cheering here. It's a great story, and I want the story to continue. The, the finale, Ole Miss, we've got it at 13. This line's been jumping all over creation. Got down to 10.5 at one point. It opened at 14 at one point. Ole Miss plus 13 at number five. Wow, LSU, 8.15 p.m. on ESPN. Neil McCready? All week I said I would take Ole Miss in the points, and then I just – I look at Ole Miss's defensive stats, and I just can't do it. I, I, I don't – I don't know how Ole Miss holds that any team in the SEC right now under 35 points. And I just don't know that – I don't know that – I mean, look, Ole Miss is going to hit some big plays, but I'm a little concerned after the Alabama game that the offense is so big play dependent that when you count on that – you talked about this, Chase, from day one. You were talking about it – you and I were texting about it during the Texas Tech game. That if you are so dependent on, hey, every time you get in trouble, let's go deep. It's going to be hard to do that in Baton Rouge when they know what's coming and they bring guys like Devin White and stuff. LSU's been able to create pressure without blitzing. That's kind of their shtick. They're not going to blitz a whole lot this year so far. You want a stat? Sure. LSU blitzed against Auburn one play. One play. They brought uh, Devin White on a delay blitz. One play. They got pressure with their front four. If they get pressure with their front four against Ole Miss, it's lights out. Now, Ole Miss on the other side, as you've pointed out, is the best pass-blocking team in the league. They're the most efficient pass-blocking team in the SEC. So something in there has to give. If you could tell me what gives, I'd have a better idea. I just It's very difficult for me to, to see Ole Miss matching points with LSU. What do you think, Matty? Yeah, I know I'm in the same boat. Um, I, well, but I also thought that Ole Miss would put up more than seven against Alabama, so you can't trust anything that I think. But, yeah, yeah I just don't – like you're saying, I don't see their defense being able to really stop LSU, and I think that will snowball. And and it's in Baton Rouge at 8 p.m. like we just talked about. So, uh I know I've gone with so many of the favorites, but I'm going with LSU on this one, too. I'll give mine in a second give a spill, but I'm kind of curious. When you take over a beat like this, how do you look toward, not, not focusing on it for work or content, but just to understand everything, how do you look at histories and program, and how do you kind of go back to study you know, who you're covering and, 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 and what's going on in the past? Yeah, my first – well, usually there's a large move involved. So my first step – is to listen to as many podcasts as possible on my drive over. Um, and then, r- yeah, really just read as much as you possibly can and, and talk to as many people who know more than you. And, but, the, I mean, with Ole Miss, it's, you can get the history, and then you look at the past couple years are so much almost separated from that. There's so little yeah. that you can take from – four Ole Miss teams four years ago that will help you predict anything like, you know, game outcomes here. Yeah, you know, Neil hates this, and I'm a little more on the history thing. He thinks it's completely irrelevant. It is probably completely irrelevant to some degree. 
But because Matt's the coach, Ole Miss plays typically really well in Baton Rouge. Two years ago, they got just gashed by Fournette and got our guys or whoever it was. Maybe it was both. Um, and, and, and they got blown out a little bit down there. But Ole Miss has stayed within 13 points of LSU all but one time in Baton Rouge since 1995. That, only, only twice since 95, 95 and two years ago, has Ole Miss – not stayed inside that uh, number. Typically, they play almost better in Baton Rouge than they do in Oxford for whatever reason between those two teams. I do think Ole Miss uses a little more short passing game. Longo's talked about that a little bit this week, uh, but especially Matt really more than more than Phil, of getting the ball to A.J., getting the ball to D.K. in space, closer to the line of scrimmage, let them be receivers that, that run with it rather than catch it down the field, a lot like what Freeze was able to do with Treadwell a good bit during his career. If they do that, LSU is so bad offensively. I understand Ole Miss's linebacker issues and everything, but Burrow has just not shown me enough there. He's still completing 49% of his passes. I know he hasn't thrown a pick, so he's thrown three touchdowns. Ole Miss probably gets at least two big plays against Christian Fulton at some point during this game, whether that's DK yeah. or AJ on that side. I think LSU probably wins, but I think this one's close. I, th- I think Ole Miss is inside 10 points for this one on Saturday night, and that probably gives them a little bit of a gear as they, uh, as they move forward. As much as, like, moral victories is a you know frowned upon phrase that that would be a moral victory for them. I think you're right I'm n- normally not one to do the yeah, whole moral victory thing I usually hate them I, I think there is a moral victory to be had now on the flip side I think along the lines of what we talked about about ULM in a week there's a moral victory to be had there's also a devastating loss to be had I, th- I think like if let's say and i don't think this happens let's say it's an lsu 31 point win just i don't think that happens but let's just say it does i don't know how you get the kids back from that one given what's remaining on the schedule um you know you still have auburn you still have carolina you still have state at that point no wins automatic ULM's not automatic at that point. Vanderbilt's not automatic. Arkansas's not automatic at that point. So I think this is a – there's positives that you can take from this game if, if they can do it that don't necessarily have to include a win. And I, I don't say that very often in this league, but given the state of the program and it's a first-year coach and stuff, I, I think, I think if, you told Ole, if you told me today that Ole Miss lost 27-21 to 21 and that they were in it the whole game – I'd say you can build on that. Yeah, you build it in two ways. Like you said, just from a momentum thing, a confidence thing, of finally staying in one of these yeah. games that's not Southern Illinois or not Kent State. Because, I mean, you know, it's kind of funny. You beat the Texas Tech of today, and it makes you feel a lot better at maybe beating the Texas Tech that you did in week one because that was a team ranked eight out of ten teams or whatever there are in the Big, T- Big 12 at this point. So that would have been a little different. And also, here's what it's also going to do if Ole Miss can stay in this thing for four quarters. They're going to count on Gavante Ruggs and Jacquez Jones and Keytron Smith and all these young guys. They're going to grow up in a, in a positive way if yeah. they can keep this into a game because they're going to see an environment they haven't seen on Saturday night. I mean, all jokes aside, I mean, it's the one in, in 14 that rattled Bo Wallace. It's the one that two years ago A.J. Brown says he gets a little intimidated by it at, at times there as well. So there's going to be a bit of baptism by fire for those guys on Saturday night. And if they handle that well, I think defensively it's kind of like what they got from the front four against Kent State, even though that was just Kent State. State. I think the back seven would see some of that moving forward as well for uh, for Ole Miss. I mean, I've said this before. I asked Greg Little back in the preseason, what game are you looking forward to? And Greg, nothing against Greg. He likes cliches. And he'll get out of an interview as fast as he can. And I expect it, uh, every game's the same. Instead, he said, I'm looking forward to LSU. And so I said, of course, why? And he said, because I let that environment get to me two years ago. We didn't handle it well. I kind of wish we had that one back. I'm looking forward to going back there. It was fun. And we let it get to us. I want it to be fun and it not get to us. So you're right. I mean, the, the young guys that are on that defensive side, this is going to be a new deal. And how quickly they adapt to it and handle it and stuff is it, – it, it's they're going to go through some growing pains. But, I mean, it's, it's been repetitive. There's They don't have to win this game for it to be a positive. But it can be a real negative. There's – it's not a throwaway game. It's not a free shot and all that stuff. You, you need to play well. He's also going to hit at least his prediction on Scotty Phillips. He said 800 yards for uh, Scotty Phillips this season. Phillips already at 467 yards rushing after 204 against Texas Tech, 107 against Southern Illinois, and then 112 against Kent State last week. So I think he's well on the way to, to 800 or more. 
go. Well, and I think we've talked about, you were talking about ULM as a potential, could be a huge negative impact, but I think if they stay in the game on Saturday and then after that have like an actual dominant win where they look good for four quarters, the combination of the two can yeah. really accelerate them into a, a much better second half of the season, much oh, yeah. more consistent. I agree. Because Arkansas is next, too, which is very gettable. I mean, the Razorbacks aren't Frankly, good. Frankly, ULM might be a tougher challenge than Arkansas could be if you're playing yeah, well and you're Even with a loss, right you could end up 5-2 and and moving into the eighth yeah. game of the season. And, yeah. You know, there's, again. No, there's no doubt about it. I mean, it, it, you can use a close game where you play well. Not a fluky close game, but a close game where you play well as a springboard into with the next difficult game that you have is not until October the 20th, and you could get a lot better by October the 20th. Yeah. The flip side is that you play poorly, and then you spiral, and then it's hard to snap out of the spiral. Picks will be up in the morning again, Neil's, uh, Neil's picks, and then this uh, recording up on all the places that you listen to podcast as well. 8.15 Saturday night from Baton Rouge. Neil McCready, Matty will be in attendance. I'll be, I guess, working the desk, if you will, from uh, – from Oxford, probably doing a podcast somewhere around two thirty in the morning at that time. Okay. So we'll uh, we'll get. Well, I'll be watching golf. The Ryder Cup will be on, oh, so I'll be go. up anyway. We'll we'll hang out and, and and do it. So more coming up on there. We'll be back at Funky's next week prior to ULM. One of Neil's alma maters, his two alma maters clashing on the gridiron next weekend. So uh, appreciate Maddie joining us. Talk to you next week.